hate Sydney. Like, I really hate Sydney. And the reason is, three years ago, that's where I lived. My brother and I ran a business that, as you can tell, wasn't going very good. And we lived in a warehouse on Parramatta Road in Leichhardt, where we were running what was a nightmare disguised as an online uh, e-commerce retail business. We borrowed, we borrowed a significant amount of money to fund this and we were young, naive, we thought we knew everything, we made every mistake in the book. Everybody says that, but like we had no competitive advantage, there was no margin in anything we sold. Um, it was a website called bicyclestore.com.au. I hate cyclists. I did then, I still do now. In fact, I hate them more. <laughs> and I'm actually not joking when I say that. Like, I didn't like them at all, which is a terrible, terrible reason to run a business, as you probably know. But had that not happened, we lost about 300 grand when it was all said and done. I wouldn't be here right now. And I wouldn't have had the single greatest marketing discovery that I'm going to share with you this, uh, this evening. This diagram that my designer hand drew about three hours ago because I opened my slides up and thought, fuck, I haven't got that designed yet. <laughs> Helped a Melbourne business coach make 75 grand in a single week. Helped one of my clients in LA make 100 grand a month and can help anyone in this room who runs a business where they, as the face of the business, leverage themselves to uh, sell more of their products and services. Now, when I ran that first business that went terrible, I learned a bunch of things. And it helped me discover this. It's what I call the copy slide principle. And since making this discovery, I've been able, fortunate enough to travel the world. This is a photo I took with two dear friends of mine. I was in Vancouver about two years ago, what was that, May? Shortly after that, I was at Laguna Beach in California. I then went to Mexico with this random chick I met when I was in a Vegas nightclub one night. I took that photo at this uh, lookout. It was like some Lord of the Rings type shit, like you could see the whole empire. A year later, I went to Switzerland. I was speaking at a gig in Zurich. I then went to Berlin and hung out with my sister. Came back to Melbourne, got sick of how shitty our winter was, so I went and watched some NFL in the States. And this was last week. I literally hopped off a plane yesterday. It took 32 hours to get home from New York. That's at the top of the Empire State Building. Uh, and anyway, the point I'm making here is, guys, I didn't show you all that stuff to tell you how amazing my life is, because it is pretty fucking cool. <laughs> but I want to demonstrate that when you understand marketing, when you have a proven leverageable system, you can literally go from living in squalor to whatever your dream lifestyle is. And I want to give all of that, I want to give that tonight to all of you and share with you everything I've learned. So who am I? For those of you that have never heard of me, I'm a, a copywriter, that's my core skill set. I get paid to travel and write words that inspire people to change their life. I've spent half a million dollars on Facebook advertising in the last three years. I've been fortunate enough to work with some incredible people um, that I'll talk about uh, throughout this presentation. I've traveled a lot and yeah, I've had a lot of experience. I've worked in probably 12 or 15 different industries uh, and I'm gonna share with you all the things I've learned tonight. I've also worked, I worked with Ty Lopez, who here knows who Ty Lopez is. I filmed some content for one of his programs when I was in LA last year. I've had some of my work published on the, the ClickFunnels blog, uh, an article I wrote, that was, that was probably a couple of years ago now, uh, which was a really a big achievement for me. I went to the States, as I said, I was in New York, and this picture here on the right is one of my clients. I spoke um, at a conference in Dallas. It was like 550 people there, and like 525 of them were women, so. I've done worse things in my life. But uh, these are some of the things I've been able to do in the last three years since I got into marketing. 
and uh, developed my career and learned the things I'm going to share with you this evening. I voted myself Australia's best looking marketer recently <laughs> for a couple of reasons. One being it's true. <laughs> I said that in Dallas to all these chicks, they thought it was hilarious. You guys might, might not write it, write it, but anyway. Uh, I just chucked that slide in for a bit of a laugh. But yeah, I post this. If you follow me on Facebook, that's how Dan got to know me. I post some questionable things. Just ask my mother. So what I'm going to share with you tonight, guys, is it's what I call the copy slide principle. And it's what I showed on that diagram earlier. It's the process of taking someone from being a cold prospect who has no idea who you are or what you sell or how you can help them and turn them into a high-paying client. Who here would be interested in hearing more about that? Awesome. It's the exact same process I took a really well-renowned Melbourne business coach through and we launched a campaign. We did about 75 grand in sales in a week. Actually, I didn't. I've got a screenshot where he sent that to me in a text. I didn't put that in my slide deck. And it's basically a three-step process. And if we have time, I'm going to take someone through it live. I'm going to put myself on the spot and see if we can produce something cool because I want to show you guys how this process plays out. All right, so who here runs a business out of curiosity? Awesome. Oh, Mitch, what's going on, man? I didn't recognize you there. What, what businesses have we got in the room, just so I can figure out? Build cultures. Sorry? Build cultures. Build cultures. Cultures. Okay, like, like for... Employees and outwards, basically employees and collaborators and outwards building a tribe, bringing your customers. Okay, awesome, awesome. Yes, yeah, health coach. Health coach, cool. Yeah. yeah. What else have we got? Man, do you, you're on a business? Yeah. Um, Sorry? Okay, cool, cool. Awesome. B2B I've thought about you, mate. I've don't, I don't, I got, I got some questions for you. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, I've got an antidote to fake news. Uh, antidote to fake news. Yeah, how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> Do you unfollow Trump on Twitter? or? <laughs> People come to my site, they read both sides of the debate, and they get to choose. What is fact and what is That's pretty interesting. I like that. That's cool. Anyone else? Tech Sorry? Tech recruitment. recruitment, so people that work in the tech industry? Yeah. Okay, cool. Anyone else? Anything different to that? Marketing agents. Awesome. Yeah, virtual tours. Virtual tours. So how, how does that work? Yeah, awesome. Cool. Anyone else? Uh, marketplace. Uh, like an industrial marketplace. So, manufacturer like a consumer. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Awesome. All right. I've got a good idea of who's here, so we can figure out. I can figure out how to best tailor it to everyone that's here, which will be awesome. So, guys, before we get carried away, I just want to nerd out for a second and talk about marketplace sophistication, because I feel like this is something that most people massively overlook. Any marketing campaign that fails, fails for one reason and one, well, there's probably more, but here's the main reason why they fail. The message that you put out to the market does not match the level of sophistication that the market you're targeting is currently at. Marketplace sophistication or the sophistication of a market is, how, is based on how many times a certain market has seen a marketing message from someone in the same industry as you or someone who competes with you. So, for example, if we take uh, weight loss. Before anyone had ever created a product or a service to help people with weight loss, you could have gone out to that market and been like, hey, like um, your like claim for your product or service could have been lose weight if you're a personal trainer. Like you could have been lose weight and everyone would have been like, oh shit. So like when Uber came out, they were just like, we're ride sharing and no one knew who that was. They didn't need to make an outrageous claim. They didn't need to say, oh, we'll help you share rides in 30 minutes or less or something like that because no one knew what it was, right? Very, very early stage market. When the market gets evolved and more people come into that blue ocean and reach the second stage, we go from having the basic claim to an expanded claim. So instead of lose weight, at the second stage of the market, well, I've got a slide for this actually, the what stage of the market, you need to say exactly what the offer is. So it might be like lose five kilos in 30 days or if it was like a, a weight loss pill, at stage one, it's just like weight loss pill or burn fat. But at stage two, it's gonna be burn a certain amount of fat in a certain amount of time. The claim or what the product can do gets expanded 
So we can now provide more in less time. And so in a stage one hello market for making money on the internet, the marketing claim is literally make money online, or the promise is make money online. But at stage two, when more people enter that market, it's make 100 grand in 90 days, make six figures online. Where most markets are that you'll find that most people enter, stage three, which is what we call a why market. And the reason for this is simple. Once you reach this level of sophistication, you need to bring in a mechanism, a strategy, a formula, a process that takes the, sorry, you need to bring in a, a strategy or a formula or a process that explains why or uh, something unique that makes that claim happen. So now it might be like lose five kilos in 30 days using the ABC method or um, you all would have seen ads for weight loss products that say things like some ancient Chinese herb someone found is the secret to losing weight. At the stage three level, you need to introduce what we call a unique mechanism. So in the case of making money online, which I'm going to show you some examples of shortly, you might have a certain method. I, I'll show you one for this business coach. We called it the Schumacher method. It's a specific process you can go through to make money online. So now, instead of just making an outrageous claim to your market about how much you can make or how little time it can take to make it, you're saying, nah, I've got a unique process for making that money. No one else has it. The only way for you to get that is to do what I do or to follow me. And I'm going to show some examples of that. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Any questions about that? Cool. Awesome. So, oh, great work formatting the slides, James. These are the marketing problems business owners face. If you, for those playing at home, couldn't figure that out. Most people I speak to, they can't find a way for their marketing message to stand out. They can't find a way for people to say, see how they're different to their competitors. Everyone thinks we're the same. And you get into this red ocean where people are just make, trying to make bigger and more expanded claims. And they're trying to say like, nah, my product can help you make this much more money in this less amount of time. Or, you know, just more and more claims. It's what's happening right now in the ride sharing space. You've got Lyft coming, oh, is Lyft coming out here? I don't know. But you've got like uh, Taxify and there's a bunch I see ads for all the time in Melbourne. They've gone from that stage one market where everyone was excited about ride sharing and kind of needed to be told what it was before they got on board. And now there's competitors coming out saying, oh, no, nah, like it's 50% off. I think there's one, is it Taxify? One in Melbourne I saw ads for. All rides were like 50% off when they started. They get into a point where it's hard to differentiate themselves between their competitors, and then you end up in a price war. It's a race to the bottom. And if you've studied economics, we know that in any market, in the long term, profit goes to zero for this exact reason. The other issues people have is they can't generate leads. And if they can generate leads, they can't generate the leads they want. They can't attract the quality clients they want. And that's the problem they end up with. And that's what I want to talk about, the copy slide principle, which is my marketing methodology that I developed over the last three years of running thousands of campaigns in all these different markets. Because I had this discovery about what it takes to stand out, to generate leads that are quality, and to make sure that your marketing cuts through when you're uh, communicating with your marketplace. So I want to tell two stories. There's a really well-renowned speaker. His name's Josh Shipp. I think he's British, but he could be from America. Um, and one of my really good friends, one of my best friends, was running a marketing campaign for this guy in 2016. And at the time, I was just writing a lot of ads. And this guy, he was helping parents with troubled teens, troubled teenage kids. And he had some program. I can't even remember what he sold specifically. But between the two of us, we I can't remember how we came up with it, but we theorized this idea that if we wrote out his story as a really long ad, long ads were becoming popular on Facebook at the time, and if we wrote out his story in an engaging way, in a really long ad, it would just be a good way to get this webinar to convert. There was no, there was no real, it was more of like a test we were running. So he said to me, oh, hey, man, do you want to write an ad for me? We'll tell this guy's story, and then... We will just see how it goes. It's like, yeah, yeah, sure. So I wrote this ad. It was about 1,500 words long from memory. And the thing went like gangbusters. Like it got so much engagement on Facebook, so many comments and shares, because it was all about how he was from a home where his dad had beaten him up, I think, and he ended up in foster care, and he bounced around from house to house. And then eventually he ended up in a scenario where uh, one of the foster homes he ended up in, the male role model that he had or the father figure that he had sort of put his foot down and didn't take any of his shit and it changed his whole life. And anyway, all these parents were going crazy about this ad. 
and I don't, I don't have a copy of it today. I'd probably be able to find one. But at that time, I probably didn't realise how impactful it was. Me and my mate were like, shit, this story, there's something to this whole story thing. There's something to tell in your story. Because people emotionally connect to your story. And so we kind of just put it in the back of our mind. And for the next probably four or five campaigns we worked on together, we would do long story ads. And I'm going to show some examples shortly. And, and it just kept, ha kept happening. It just Every campaign we worked on, it was like we had this Midas touch. You know, there would still be issues in the funnel or in the ads or whatever. But the, the oh, sorry, in maybe how the ads got delivered. But we would get really high engagement, really high click-through rates. And we started to see this pattern developed. And so I ended up creating a process I'm going to talk about in a second this eight-step process I go through that I write ads with um, that gets a lot of engagement. But I, I started to latch onto this idea of story and how important story was. And that's probably nothing new for everyone here. You've probably heard a lot about story, I'm going to assume, because everyone talks about it. But I feel like no one talks about it in the right way or how to leverage it, which is what I want to share. And then secondly, probably about three months ago, I was consulting to this guy. And... Just prior to consulting to him, I'd been reading a book by a guy named Todd Brown. Todd Brown's a really uh, well-renowned marketer. He talks about marketplace sophistication. He talks about unique mechanisms and a bunch of the things that um, I really follow him heavily and have, have based some of my campaign work on the things that he's created. Anyway, in this book, he's talking about the idea of creating a unique mechanism, what I just described before. And so I'm talking to this guy on the phone one day and... He was a business consultant that helped people scale their Shopify store. And his particular offer was that he could show you how to scale to like $1,000 a day or something like that. That was like his promise. And I said to him, oh, cool. Well, you're going to need like some sort of mechanism to facilitate that so that people understand why you're someone they should listen to. And he was like, awesome, all right. And he came up with this whole IP around whatever his process was. It was called, and he called it the Blackbird Method, right? And it was this six-step process. Anyway, I'm standing in my apartment in uh, South Bank in Melbourne and we're on the phone and I just had this light bulb moment where I realised that if he told his story, oh, cause, sorry, I asked him, I said, what's your story? And he said, oh, well, it's funny you asked that. My wife had this really crippling, debilitating disease. I can't remember what it was. She was perfectly fine and healthy and then seemingly overnight, she just totally went under and she was... Uh, in basically incapacitated, I couldn't talk to her, she was in hospital, she was on, on life support. And like seemingly before my eyes, my whole life started flashing before me and my wife was about to die and, and I just had this moment where I realised like if she's okay, or even if she's not, I can't keep doing this job I hate that he was doing at the time. I need to go on and live my dream and build this business and provide this amazing lifestyle for my family. And when he was telling me the story, I was kind of touched by it. I was like, man, that's deep, that's really cool. And so he told me that, and then we get on to talking about this mechanism, and I just had this light bulb moment where I realised, your story, every single person here has a story, right? And I'll talk about that in a second. But everyone has a story that they mostly don't leverage because they don't think it's relevant, or they're afraid to share it, or they think no one will care about it. And that's true if you don't tell it right. But everyone has a story, and within that story, they're going to have learned something that's different to what every single other person has learned, because we've all been through different stuff. No one has the same life experiences as everyone else. So therefore, everyone's unique if they tell their own story. And through those life experiences, they're going to have developed their own IP, their own mechanism, their own strategy, their own formula that they can use in their marketing. And that mechanism is going to be the thing that delivers their core marketing promise in their business. Now, I just covered about four years there in a minute, so that might sound pretty heavy. But I had this epiphany moment that if you link your story, your story is the thing that provides credibility to the unique mechanism or the unique element of the thing that you offer in your business. And your business is centered primarily around a promise. If you have those three things, you can stand out from every other competitor in your marketplace and you can grow your business. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate. And I learned that through these two things that happened to me. So this is essentially what I call the copy slide principle. So we got a, I don't have a red dot. If you have cold, this is like, like I said, hand-drawn diagram. It actually looks pretty solid. Yeah, this is a cold prospect, someone who has no idea who you are. And it's essentially a slide to get them from here to your customer. Your marketing promise is like the conduit you deliver. So by the promise, what I mean is scale someone to $1,000 a day on Shopify. 
lose five kilos in 30 days if you're a health coach. Make 100 grand in 90 days if you're a business coach or you're an internet marketer. Generate 1,000 leads a month if you're a uh, marketing agency for your clients. Anything you want, you know? So whatever, you need to figure out what the core promise is that you deliver to your, to your customers. Because every single business has a promise in their marketing. They have a claim. Otherwise, we would have no reason to deliver our services, right? Your dentist is making your teeth healthier or your teeth whiter. Your doctor is saving your life, you know, probably in a more specific way, whatever the procedure is that he does. Every single business has a promise. And delivering that promise, communicating that effectively is taking someone from a cold prospect to a customer. And the way you do that is through leveraging your story and the unique element or mechanism in your marketing. So as I said, part one is the promise. What do you actually help your clients achieve? I want you to think about that right now if you run a business. Like, what do you actually help your clients with? What's the, what's the thing you deliver? Is it a certain number of leads? Is it an increase in sales conversion? Is it a, a, a software tool that helps people get a certain outcome? There is a promise you have, and that's why you're in business. It's the primary reason you're in business, because you help people get that outcome. You help people with that promise or that claim. Does that make sense to everyone? Anyone got any questions? Yeah, that's a good So, like, part of the dumb business I've got is, like, say, like, everyone has a story, right? And all of a sudden, like, you're on Facebook and everyone's putting out story ads. Doesn't that become some part of the new story? <laughs> Technically, yes. But that's like saying if you bought a red Honda Jazz and I bought one, yeah. would everyone else start driving one? Like, you'd see more of them, but they were always there. But they probably wouldn't. Okay, yeah, so, um, yeah, so I, I think I pretty much, like, <laughs> made my point already. Um, so, like, pretty much, like, yeah, you'll get to a stage, like, you won't really get to a stage where um, there'll be too many stories about because everyone's going to have, like, their own way of doing it, I guess. No, everyone's going to take this approach. And it's not going to flood the market with stories. You just got to, you got to tell yours before I tell everyone else to tell theirs. Yeah. <laughs> no, to answer your question, no, it's not going to happen. That's like saying if yeah. you ran a Facebook ad, isn't everyone else going to start running Facebook ads? Like at some point, yeah. Yeah. But it's not something you never need to worry about, you know. Yeah, okay. Cool. Yeah. But I'll talk more about stories in a second. Yeah. I, I just had a point to add up on that. Not everyone will relate to your story. Not is it working? Story. That's a good point. So Guys, this everyone, is a catch everyone, box. Oh. Please talk into it when you have questions. Yes, so I don't think it's working. <laughs> <laughs> okay, never mind. Okay, I'm going to pretend. <laughs> I'm going to pretend it's working. So everyone wouldn't relate to your story. There's a specific people that would relate to your story. For example, if even if everyone ran a story, okay, there are only a few people who would relate to you. Not everyone would relate to you. So it still segments your market anyways. Yeah. Naturally. Which is how that's what organic yeah. reaches. We'll we'll get to the story part in a second. I just want to talk about the promise. Why didn't you offer me that mic then? I'm gonna. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna destroy that people. I'm having technical difficulties today. So you're right. Yeah, you're right. You can talk to the chat box. Now. Awesome. So yeah, guys, here's the examples I gave before, and I'm gonna illustrate some of these further down the track. A business coach could, but their promise could be a hundred grand in ninety days. That's what I help you achieve. A financial planner, it could be three properties in three years. It could be a certain percentage increase on your investment portfolio. It could be an increase in your super balance. Now, obviously, the financial planning space is heavily regulated. What you can legally run is a totally different question. Just want to clarify that. I'm not, you don't take legal advice from me. I, I run all sorts of outrageous claims. Um, if you're a men's tailor, I'm going to show a video shortly of the, probably one of the best ads I've ever seen. And it's for a physical product, which is why I really like it, because I do a lot of stuff in information and consulting. Um, but their, their promise is the best fitted shirt you've ever worn, if you're a man. Um, a health coach could be lose five kilos in 30 days. Real estate, sell your home, or sell your home in 120 days is kind of like a more advanced promise, like I just said. Marketing agency, generate 1,000 leads a month. There's a gym in Melbourne called Ultimate You. And... They have a, it's more of a guarantee than a promise, but they have a challenge they run. It's called the 9 in 6 challenge. And how they get people in the door is, if you do their challenge and you lose 9 kilos in 6 weeks, it's free. 
It's pretty awesome. When I heard about that, I was like, that's awesome because people are going to achieve what they want, but then they're going to stay a client anyway. And the, the guy has like 15 gyms just in Melbourne or something like that. So guys, step two is the mechanism. Now, let me just talk a little bit more about why you need a unique mechanism or a unique element or strategy or formula to what you do. Um, the whole idea of a, a unique mechanism is that for, you, for a prospect, when they see what you talk about or when they see your content or your marketing or the things that you sell, they see something unique and they think, I've never had that before or I've, never, I've had this problem for a while, say it's weight loss. I haven't seen the ABC system for losing weight. It gives them hope. It makes them think maybe that's why I haven't got the results I want. Not because I'm lazy and undisciplined, I eat the wrong foods, I don't go to the gym and I'm just a generally shit person. It's because I don't have that system, right? That mechanism gives them hope. And when people have hope, they'll do crazy things. And hope is generally what buys, drives a lot of buying decisions in the marketplace. And the power of a mechanism is something that's really strong. Like Mitch, for you, Mitch runs a company called Sign On Site and they have like a construction app. It could be like your geo field, uh, whatever you call that thing. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, <laughs> uh, but it could be that part of what you do. But that could be a bad example too. So the whole idea of having something unique is one, you stand out from everyone in the marketplace. But to all of your prospects, if they see all these people getting results with your ABC method or system or process, they start to realize, well, hang on. That could be the reason why I haven't got the results I want. That's, that's why they're getting the results they want. It's not because they did the work or they disciplined or they, whatever. It's because of the mechanism. And once you start selling the mechanism, it becomes infinitely more powerful because people understand that they need that mechanism to get the outcome and the only way to get that outcome is to pay you. So some examples of that, and I'm going to talk about this in a second. With this business coach I worked with, we called their mechanism the Schumacher Method. Uh, a financial planner client of mine, his system for growing wealth was called the Shield system. The men's tailor, the video I'm going to show you, um, their mechanism, which is actually a physical, literally a zipper, literally a physical mechanism called the Zip Fit. And my personal trainer called his thing the Muscle Pyramid system. So you can either create, there's different types of mechanisms. You can actually have a real physical one, like the Zip Fit that I'm going to show in a second. Or you can have what's called a transubstantiated mechanism, which is kind of where you just make up some fancy words to describe your IP or process. And then the third part, guys, is the story. And the reason why you need all three elements is because the story, all the things you've been through in your life, or the brand, when the brand tells its story, all of those things provide credibility to the mechanism. And then the mechanism is the actual thing that functionally delivers the promise that you have in your company. If you just have a promise like, I can help you lose five kilos in 30 days. Oh, cool, James, how do you do that? Uh, I've got this system I take people through. It's a series of 30-minute workouts called the Unicorn Method. There's no, like, credibility as to why that would work. A bunch of people could be like, oh, yeah, this helped me, and I got results, and this helped me, and I got results, and that would help to provide credibility. But if I said to you, hey, I was 200, I was going to say 200 pounds. We're not in America anymore. If I was 30 kilos overweight, and I tried all these different things and I tried keto and I was vegan for a while and I was paleo and I had all these problems and I got my metabolism tested and I stumbled across this thing called the unicorn method or, you know, I went out into the hills of the Blue Mountains and I met this like Tibetan monk and he showed me some stuff about fasting and I ended up developing this system I call the unicorn method. You'd be like, hmm, that's interesting. Like you've tried all this other stuff. Um, and so the power of telling your story makes people go, that's why the mechanism works, because you've done all this other stuff. A really good example in the weight loss space is a guy called Drew Manning. He's a guy in the States that runs a company called Fit to Fat to Fit. So this dude, right, pretty crazy story, and that's pretty much why it sells. He uh, was always in shape, always fit dude, strong, ripped, had a six pack, and he was a personal trainer. And he was training all these clients, and he was getting people that were really unfit and unhealthy and out of shape, and he was just whipping them into shape and like just physically beating them up in workouts. Not intentionally, he was just trying to get really awesome results out of them. And he was watching all these clients like, like literally like spew up after sessions. And he had some complaints where people said to him, oh, you know, you don't know what it's like, like you've always been fit, you don't know what it's like to be fat and overweight and all this stuff. And he goes, you're right, I don't. So he goes on a six-month journey. He gains 75 pounds intentionally, gets super fat and overweight, and then he loses all the weight. And then he writes a book about it. New York Times bestseller, business explodes. Because all of a sudden, 
He could relate to his audience better than they could relate to himself. He knew what it was like. He documented the whole process. And the story, the story sounds so insane to any outsider that they're like, holy shit, I need to read that book. So, you know, he just had the third part of what he did and he added it to the other things he was doing. But that's why I fundamentally believe that story is so impactful. And every single person has a story. I, I, I believe this more so than anything. And everyone, I meet a bunch of people, they say, oh, I don't. I'm like, oh, that's interesting because I can already tell you from a foreign country. So tell me what you've been through. And even if you're like, I'm private school educated, I, uh, I don't have some mad rags to riches story other than the stuff I put myself through, which added to my story. But you don't even need to have that. Everyone has done something in this world that makes them unique and different to every other person. And when you leverage it and you understand how to, to communicate that to people, you'll realise that you can make yourself different to every other competitor in your marketplace. It's just that no one does it because people are afraid to be vulnerable. They don't want to share the hard things they've been through. They don't want to be really raw and authentic. And I understand that. That's part of it. But when you do that, people relate. When you share emotion, people feel emotion. And then they, they, they connect with you being real. I, I spoke at this conference in Dallas last week. And I talked about, like, I, I firmly believe the content I'm sharing here is significantly better than what I talked about in Dallas. In Dallas, it was a bunch of people that own, funnily enough, e-commerce businesses. So I'm probably the last person you want to hear from. But I was talking about how to create your brand story. All I did was talk about telling stories, right? And... Afterwards, a bunch of people came up to me and they were like, oh, that was incredible. And some chick was like, oh, I started crying. I told this story at the start about how uh, my sister had this drug problem and uh, I was telling the story. And the whole point I was trying to do was to make people feel. And as I'm telling the story, well, after I, after I gave that talk, I went and watched a bunch of other speakers. And some were good, some were average. But there was like a, one of the keynote speakers was talking about success and mindset and stuff. And, and she said this thing that really resonated with me about um, the specific quote was, sooner or later, the circle of people you associate with has to start looking like where you're going, not where you've been, right? And that was just a comment. For whatever reason, it resonated with me. But when she said it, I like felt it deep inside, like it struck a chord with me. And then uh, something else happened where someone said something that struck a chord with me while I was in the US. I can't remember what it was. But I had this realisation where when all these people were telling me how good my talk was, and I genuinely didn't feel like the content was anywhere near my best. But I realised this. If you move people emotionally, they'll retain your message. I had this like breakthrough moment where I realised like if you want someone to fully inherit and, and take on board your message, take on board your content and like have it stick with you, you need to move them emotionally. It's almost like this thing where you need to open them up. You need to like shock them emotionally, tell a crazy story, or make them feel something really intense. And then once you do that, tell them the message, the content, the boring facts and data you want them to actually take home with you, right? And that's what story does. Story makes people feel emotion. And when they feel emotion and they hear about your mechanism or your system or product or service, they're more interested in it. That's my story. So I want to share what I call the fairy tale story writing process. It's fairly complicated, so I'm just going to cover it in quick detail here and show you a bunch of examples. I've been doing this stuff for two or three years. Um, I wouldn't try and teach the whole thing in the next five minutes, but it's an eight-part process I developed after testing so many Facebook ads um, that I started out writing with my mate about, that was 2016, nearly two years ago, that... I want to share with you guys. So these are the eight functions of these long ads I write. If anyone writes ads, and I'll show you an example of it shortly, you have a headline, you then introduce yourself, you have a transition statement, and then you tell two stories and have two morals, right? And the whole idea of this is that the first story, I normally will talk about the client's upbringing, where they came from, um, a personal circumstance they had, some way that I can elicit emotion, and then that will have a moral. And it might be like, you know, uh, I'm from this really poor background and I realised I had to get out of that environment. And the reason I'm telling you that is because I very quickly at a young age understood how important the people you associate yourself with is, right? So it might be just like some, some smaller learning they had when they were younger to try and bring, um, to try and like flesh their story out and start to build some connection with the reader. Then the second story will be more related to the offer or the thing they're selling or the, uh, 
you know, particular product or service they have. So that might be a story about, you know, one of the examples I'll show is a guy who built a big property portfolio. And um, the second story was a more technical thing about, this, about his mechanism, like the system that he learned. So it'll, it'll relate more to what they're actually selling, whereas the first one will be a bit more personal about their life or something that they learned on their journey. And then finally, there'll be a call to action. So guys, I've put some bit.ly links here. Write those down and go read these ads because I'm not going to read them all to you, but I'll explain what's going on in them. I'm not even sure how many of you can read that from where you're sitting. Um, but yeah, just I made those links. Hopefully they all work. If they don't, <laughs> I'll put my Facebook up here, send me a message. But, you know, similarly with these three ads here, the one on the right was selling a, um, he had this course that taught you about how to buy property and lease it on Airbnb and how to like make a five to eight times more return or something like that than you would when, um, when you, if you just leased it out long term. In fact, all these ads I'm just looking now were written in 2016, literally all of them. I just always grab the same three examples. But they follow the same formula, like some of the headlines. How an expelled high school dropout earning $9 an hour discovered a simple investment strategy and retired at 26 with 12 properties and a $3.5 million portfolio. Right, that's his headline. And one thing I noticed when I analysed these stories that I wrote, after I'd written about 10 of them, I realised that they all did the same thing, and it's what I call the headline chasm. When you're telling a story, in the same way that I did at the start here, where I talked about when I was living on the street, essentially, or in this warehouse on Parramatta Road, and then was travelling the world, to get your prospect to take action, you want to paint what I call a chasm, right? And it's the, it's the low to the high. So it's like the lowest point you were at to the highest point you were at. So how an expelled high school dropout making $9 an hour, then build a $3.5 million portfolio at 26. And the reason that's powerful is because most people aren't making $9 an hour. If, they're, if he was starting here, they're starting about there. And most people aren't trying to retire at 26 and build a $3.5 million portfolio. So the goals they have are inside that chasm, inside that wide net that the person casts for themselves. If they, if they read your headline and they think, well, if you've gone from there to there and I'm here trying to go to here, you're someone I can trust. This happens on a very subconscious level. And I didn't even actually notice I was doing this. I create a lot of Facebook content. I have a Facebook group that I post in. And I think, no, it was on my Facebook profile. I was doing a um, Facebook Live talking about this ad writing process like four months ago. And I was reading out all these headlines live. And when I was reading them, I was like, shit, like, I, I can't, I'm actually doing this thing like where I'm painting this, casting this wide net for people that are inside that bracket that, so that they'll relate to it. You know, the other headline here, the secret strategy, a two-time self-made real estate entrepreneur discovered after going completely bankrupt in the 2008 housing crisis that skyrocketed him to financial freedom and the lifestyle of his dreams. That's a pretty long one. But again, twice made, twice self-made, went bankrupt. Things that most people will never experience, but understand that if someone's been through that, that they're going to learn from, they're going to know a lot of useful stuff. So that's one tip I'll give you with the headlines. And then, as I said, I introduce who the person is, what they've done, and then I'll transition into the stories. You know, the, the property guy we talked about, um, his story of growing up in Noosa, you know, the, the other guy, well, these are property guys as well, who went bankrupt in the housing crisis. We talked about sort of how he got into flipping homes, which is what he sold. So I want to show this video right now, and then I'll, then I'll talk about it. It's only the first minute. I'll tell you when to stop it. A few years ago on a trip to Bangkok, I was driving through the city and I got pulled over. And as the policeman was approaching... We just start again, man, and get some volume. Sure, shirt fit really well. It may sound strange. A few years ago on a trip to Bangkok, I was driving through the city when I got pulled over. And as the policeman was approaching the car, I noticed that his shirt fit him really well. It may sound strange, but it was the best fitting button down shirt I'd ever seen, and I instantly wanted to have one. I ended up asking the cop where he got his shirt, and he gave me the address to an old Thai tailor who'd been making police uniforms his whole life. And it was there that I discovered something revolutionary. The secret to the best fitting button down shirt is that it doesn't button. I'd never seen this before, but it's not just the Thai police. Police from all over the world have been putting zippers on uniforms for decades. Hi, I'm Brian, founder of Teddy Stratford. Traditionally, men's shirts have been too baggy, creating the illusion that even guys in great shape need to lose a few pounds. 
Then along came the fitted shirt, which was an improvement, but led to a different problem. Because they fit close to the body, they tend to pull and gap around the buttons, making it look like you're busting out of your shirt. Placing a zipper behind the plaque, it completely eliminates this problem. The zipper evenly distributes any tension, so you can wear a closer fitting shirt, no gapping. When I was back in New York, I teamed up with legendary custom shirt maker Carl Goldberg. For over 30 years, Carl's been making shirts for famous people, Broadway shows, a few years ago on a trip to Bangkok, I was driving through the city when I got pulled over. And as the policeman was approaching the car, I noticed that his shirt fit him really well. It may sound strange, but it was the best fitting button down shirt I'd ever seen, and I instantly wanted to have one. I ended up asking the cop where he got his shirt, and he gave me the address to an old Thai tailor who'd been making police uniforms his whole life. And it was there that I discovered something revolutionary. The secret to the best fitting button down shirt is that it doesn't button. I'd never seen this before, but it's not just the Thai police. Police from. Oh, that is so good. Jeez. Can't play too much of that to me. I get a bit, get a bit hot under the collar. I, uh, <clears throat> when you write a lot of marketing and you like geek out about it and you are subscribed to a million email lists and you sit on the train and look at billboards and like take notes and take photos of them and stuff, you. Um, you get really desensitized to marketing claims really quickly. And like it takes a lot for me to get excited about an ad. And uh, when I, I was on Instagram of all places on like a Sunday night or something, and I, like, I started watching this and like I don't even start watching ads normally, I'm, so, I'm so almost sick of it. And I was so hooked by it. And when I watched the whole ad, I, I can't remember what happened, but I like watched the ad and then I, I just got out of it or wasn't on top of my game. And I, I went looking for it and like, if I see a good ad, I'm like Liam Neeson in Taken. I'm like, I've got a specific set of skills and I'm going to find that ad. Like, and so for the next two days, I was looking everywhere for it. I was ringing my mates. I'm like, has anyone seen this ad? And I found it. And it's just a, such a good example of what I'm talking about, right? He starts off, apart from the fact it's on video, which is awesome, like he's got that pattern interrupt. And he's like, oh, I'm, uh, you know, I was in Bangkok and I got a parking ticket. And you're like, what the hell is this doing in my newsfeed? But he has this story about how he sees this guy with this crazy shirt who takes him to his secret Thai tailor, and he finds out that the secret is this mechanism, right? The, the zip fit shirt, and it's the secret to the greatest fitting um, men's, best, best fitted shirt you'll ever wear, or whatever it is. So that's their marketing promise. It's the best fitted shirt you'll ever wear. How do we do it? We've actually got a zipper. No one else has a zipper, right? And as soon as you see it, it's instantly believable. Like, guys, who here has worn a collared shirt, sees that, thinks that would fit pretty good, right? And so, but if he just comes out and just it's a normal ad and it's like, oh, hey, you want a shirt that fits good, there's a zipper, it'd still be good. But the fact that he found it in some obscure like, back street alley in Thailand, in Bangkok, makes it so much more believable because you think to yourself, that's the reason why I haven't seen this before because I haven't been to Thailand, I haven't been pulled over by the cops, I haven't got a parking ticket. And, 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 and he's almost like this hero, this unlikely hero. Like, had he not done that, then you wouldn't be here seeing how good this discovery is. And it makes it so much more, it gives you hope makes it so much more believable. So I wanted to show that example, because that's a really good example, especially in the world of physical products, of how this relates. You have your mechanism, you have your story, and you have your promise that you deliver that your client really wants to, uh, the outcome they really want to achieve. And there's those three things there. The men's best fitting shirt, the zip fit zipper, and the parking ticket in Bangkok, Thailand. So guys, I want to show you some case studies of what I'm talking about. I've talked a lot of theory up until this point, so I want to demonstrate this in a little bit more of a hardcore way. Um, firstly, so this is a client that did 75 grand in a week. Their promise was to make $100,000 in 90 days, that if you came and worked with them, they would show you how to find an additional $100,000 of revenue in your business in 90 days. Now, this is a guy in Melbourne, his name's Travis Jones. Uh, he is the founder of a uh, gym chain called Result Based Training. And they've got about 21 locations around Australia. Super successful dude. Had made about $14 million in his career. No, no, business turns over 14 mil a year. And um, I sat down with him and I interviewed him for about two and a half hours. And I said to him, uh, Tell me about basically your whole life story. So he told me, that's what I always start, I start with the story. I'm like, just tell me the whole story. And so it was a crazy story. All these businesses he ran, he started this PT boot camp um, when he was living in Canada and he started making 100 grand within three weeks and he'd done all this crazy stuff, which makes it a lot easier to market when you do it right. And so he takes me through his whole process 
and tells me about all these different businesses he'd run over the course of his career. I go home, I ring up one of my best mates, I'm like, dude, I just interviewed Trav, crazy, you want to have a listen to it? He was like, yeah, so I send it to my mate Ricky, and he has a listen to it, and then I think the next day, I only listened, I think I only listened back to about 40 minutes of it, or I don't even know if I listened back to it, because I was obviously there, and I ring Ricky up the next day, I was like, dude, what do you think Trav has in common with all of these different businesses that he's run for all these crazy results he's got? And Ricky was like, um, he reverse engineers everything, gets really clear on the outcome, and he reverse engineers the whole process. And I was like, yeah, but it's pretty boring. Like, everyone talks about reverse engineering. And so I'm, like, standing at home in my office, and I was like, well, reverse engineering, engineering. I'm like, what do I think about when I think of engineering? I think of Formula One. It's like Michael Schumacher is the most, like, famous Formula One driver. That'll do, right? So we create, we call his process, it was this four-step process, the Schumacher method. Uh, that was how he was able to take anyone and grow their business. He'd grown a lot of seven-figure businesses. But that was his method for any, starting any business and growing it rapidly, right? And then we used that storytelling process I just went through for a Facebook ad. And this is what it looked like. Um, how a struggling PT and business owner from Perth discovered a secret system that grew his gym to 21 locations, 85 staff and $14 million in revenue. Hey, I'm Travis. Introduces himself. In the past year, my wife Liv and I have built uh, RBT gyms to over eight figures and 21 locations across two countries. Business Performance Coaching, which is his consulting company, to 800 grand in four weeks and then into a multi-million dollar company. And his digital marketing agency to a million bucks in 12 weeks. How did we do it? Uh, well, he goes, you know, after growing all these businesses and helping my clients make over 73 mil in new sales, I realized something. The system to grow any business is exactly the same, and it's what I call the Schumacher method. Uh, and I'm going to reveal that to you, but before I do, I want to tell you a story. And then he tells his two stories. Uh, the one was one of the ones I mentioned before about growing his first boot camp to um, six figures in 21 days. And the second story, I can't even remember what the second story was, but, you know, it's a good example of it, right? And then it goes to this landing page. The secret system of PT used, ready, right? And again, he reveals his method, and the call to action is to book in a, a call with, like, his team. Uh, he called it a 100K call, because he'd show you how to make 100K in 90 days. Now, this guy's a really good example, because he's someone that has a significant amount of experience and a really interesting story to tell. But when, when he went through that with his whole team, they made seven or eight sales in the first week. And like I was saying, I have a screenshot where he sent me a message. I just didn't include that. But that's literally the whole funnel. He had a bunch of, uh, he had a bunch of audiences that were warm, that had seen his stuff before, uh, that he would have retargeted with that. But largely, we went out to cold traffic. And oh, I don't have it here. One of the, I think one of the other screenshots. No, I don't have it here. One of the other screenshots I had when, he, when we launched this ad, uh, which it actually got banned shortly after because Facebook made some changes to their policy. But he sent me a message saying, um, oh, check out all the questions on this post. And I actually, I took a screenshot of it. I just didn't include it. Everyone was commenting on the post saying, like, would this method work for this business? Oh, I'm a retail butcher. Would it work for this? I'm a, a, a dentist or a baker or whatever. Everyone was questioning, curious about the method because he'd done a lot of ads, but he'd never, ever talked about a method. He'd always had expanded claims. He'd always talked about, oh, I'll teach you the secrets to Facebook ads after spending 15 million bucks on Facebook or whatever his thing was. He'd always talk in claims. As soon as he started talking about a mechanism, everyone wanted to know what the mechanism was and would it work for them. Would it give them hope is what they essentially wanted to know. Same thing for another client that's also a business coach in LA. Her promise was make 35 grand in 35 days. Um, I didn't get the name of her system actually because I had to go into the video sales letter to read it and I literally put these slides together on the plane. Um, but we went through the same process, right? She's a Hay House author. She's worked with like Red Bull and Virgin and Branson and all these crazy brands, which made it awesome. So we had a significantly shorter ad for hers. And on top of that, when people opted into this first offer, they ended up going through like a video that qualified them heavily and went through her entire story. Um, I was going to say if I had time, I'd play it. It was actually pretty boring. So, but this funnel itself was just, she has a mastermind that's 10 grand uh, for a year, 10 grand US. And she was just making, she was converting about 70% of people that applied through her funnel. And she was making 100 grand a month uh, consistently just from a basic ad funnel um, to cold traffic. She also had a book that was, I think it was a bestseller in like an, a category with like 200,000 books in Amazon, which made it significantly easier as well. So now let's do this live. Question is, so I need to get a rundown, guys, on the businesses you've got again so I can formulate this properly.
because I do a lot of information type consulting. So tell me about your, sorry, what's your name, man? Ron. Ron, what's, what's your business? So it's so on building culture. Yep. Building culture is in words and outwards. In words, I found this process, which basically what you're talking about is a similar kind of process that um, that's the secret to not just keeping the millennials and the Gen Zs with you, yep. but actually making them your advocates so you don't even need any marketing channels. Yeah. So who's your customer? So my customer is someone who can deliver a really positive impact, really good positive impact. So it can be anyone. It can be a single person, say for example, Tony Robbins. Yeah. And it could be a big business as well. Um, say for example, Airbnb. Yeah. So and what, and what, like, do you consult to them? Yes. And what do you, like, how, how do you get your clients? Is it through, like, network referral stuff? Or do you so, run ads? Or? So, yeah, right now I, 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 didn't, I haven't got any clients. Yeah. But I had one client, but they weren't a good fit, so that's why I had to deny that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, like, um, that's why, like, the, my process is, is I'm, it's really, uh, it's really connected to the self-development process as well. Yeah. That I've understood that uh, the purpose of yourself. Yeah. Okay, and the purpose of the business, and the purpose of the people that you serve, yeah. clients or customers, if those don't align, that's another downfall as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, I'm starting with workshops. Okay, cool. Yeah, you're you're a little bit too refined in the sense that your customer is a very specific person. You wouldn't need a complicated process like that. You'd need like cold emails, how I would do something like that. No, I wouldn't say so. Why, why is that? I, I really do need that process. But because it was when I started to be vulnerable yep. and put out my story. Okay. Because that got me to this process. Yeah. Is what makes it makes people interested. Okay. I'll have to I'll have to learn a bit more sure. about your process. I don't I don't think I quite get it. Yeah, awesome man. Uh, who else have we got? What what do you got here? Oh sorry, this guy here. What what do you what do you got man? Um, nah this guy here. Me? Yeah. Um I'm working on something at the moment now um, which is sort of startup that's which is um fintech but within the mobility age care space. Yeah, tell me about it. Basically, um, let's say you need a wheelchair. Yep. Uh, it would take weeks to get an assessor from the government for the NDI to get it. Then yep. Funding during this entire time you were without a wheelchair. So effectively, it is like the aftertaste of mobility. Yep. So what's the what's the promise? So the promise is approval up to thirty grand at point of sale. Um, Oh, okay, so you can go straight up and just get... Yeah, within like nine seconds, uh, approval or something. Well, that's cool, nine seconds. And how does it, uh, how does it work? So just anyone going to buy like mobility gear? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and um, there's like uh, through, you know, what it's been on, well, not really say, but like through certain ways, like you can get an unsecured loan, up yeah. to 30 grand for products like that. Okay, so is that questionable what you can talk about, like in your marketing? Um, I can't talk about the, the process behind it, but the marketing is okay. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to talk about the finance process, to be honest with you, because I'm the marketing side of the business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, cool. That that that's interesting. Like I said, it'll be it's a little bit more specific, but you could definitely go through a process where you're like, I don't know that you would necessarily say you've got a method or a formula for getting finance, because that would just sound kind of weird. But I think you can use some of the concepts. That you can illustrate it with a story and be like, hey, you ever been in this pr predicament? Get someone old in like an ad. That's how it started. And just, I would literally call it like nine second finance or something. Or I would, I would, I would. Nine sorry? On your feet. <laughs> yeah, mate. Yeah, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I would 100% use the nine second thing. Yeah. The, nine, the nine, second, nine second wheelchair or something. It's like the four hour work week of wheelchairs. <laughs> Um, James, I do have a question. Though. Yeah, man. Um, is it is it necessary that a person has to be successful for the mechanism to work for them? Uh, it's not so much that you have to be successful, because yeah, that that was what I showed in those examples. It's that you have to demonstrate that you've solved the problem that people have. Yeah. So so yes, successful, but it's relative. Right. You know what I mean? Like it totally depends from example to example. Like if you're you know, like Mitch has a thing for construction sites. He doesn't have to have developed a construction site to prove that he can help people, you know what I mean? Just prove that he's like a step further or that he has something that can help them. Mm. So if it proves through the story that you've done it, 
maybe it could be yourself or your friends or whoever. Yeah, yeah. You could have done it for a client. You could have done it for a client. Yeah. And so you could tell their story or whatever. It's obviously, I've, it works better when you've had not just success, but multiple successes. But that's like anything, you know what I mean? So, yeah. But that's the thing. When you're starting off, what would be your, what would be your advice about that? that you haven't helped the clients? Yeah. But you've understood that this underlying process will help. So well, you'd have to be able to prove. That's it, that's yeah, you'd have to be able to prove that that, that would help them. Exactly. You know what I mean? So whether you did that by working for someone for free or yeah. you had a case study or something like that, you'd have to be able to prove with a fair degree of certainty that it would be able to help them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sick. Who else do we have? Hugh, what, sorry, man, what are you going to say? Uh, so I'm a health coach. I help corporate men lose between 10 to 15 kilos. Yeah. I'm struggling to really get corporates. I'm more struggling with a couple of corporates that I've signed up. Yeah. Um, but it's also just been general talk. Um, I, what I do is, it's obviously like health coaching and nutrition, and then I, I teach them how they can keep it flat as well. So through my program, I pretty much have tutorials of what they need to do for the amount of calories and um, volume and exercise and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I guess my story behind it is my dad was an overweight corporate, and so I guess that's kind of how I narrowed down to. Um, <coughs> Niche. And then when I started off as a Yeah. 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 So what, what I would do, and this comes back to the emotional thing with story, right? You understand that you can create a mechanism or like a specifically unique uh, angle when it comes to, oh, I've got this training program, whatever you want to call that, right? Like your mechanism, your promise is you help them lose 10 to 15 kilos. What I would do if I was you is I would have an ad that was like this, and I'm just totally going off the top of my head here, but I would say something like, in inverted, I'd have like inverted commas, and I would say, daddy, oh, hang on, how old, how old are the kids of like the average guy you help? They got kids? Uh, not oh, well, that ruins that idea. Um, but hypothetically, just for the example, because we're running out of time, say they had kids, because some of them would. I, w I would have an ad that started in inverted commas, and I would say something like this. Daddy, why can't you keep up? It hit me like a ton of bricks. When my four-year-old son, Jonathan, said that to me, I realised that something had to change. After years and years of working, slaving away at my corporate job, working from first the dawn of daylight until 10 p.m. at night, making bad health choices, I realized that I'd reached a point where I couldn't even run around in the park and kick the footy with my kids. And to hear my son actually say that and call me on that was heart-wrenching. And then I'd have something like, uh, or like, you know, you might use your name instead of Jonathan. You might be like, this is the story my dad told me when I was 16 that had happened 15 years earlier or 12 years earlier that was the catalyst for him getting in shape. Today, I'm driven by helping men that were in the same position my dad was in, in the 90s or whatever, get in the best shape of their lives. But something like that that really like anchors on the emotion of how it feels when they recognise that they're in a position they don't want to be in. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's how I'd go about it. <laughs> What medium do you use? Um, you just meet people in the street and you go, hey, can I tell you my story? <laughs> yeah. like oh, okay, I'll come, I'll come and chat to you. I'll just wind this up because we're running out of time. Guys, I have got a program called the Copy Slide Accelerator where I teach this stuff in extreme detail, the mediums to use, um, how to write these long ads, how to develop all of this IP out in your business. If you want to hear more about it, come and speak to me. And that's about it, guys. Join my Facebook group. Um, add me on Facebook. Don't play any of my videos around your kids. Um, don't watch my videos in your workplace. I don't know why I would say that. Let's just take that advice. And I filmed a video where I explain this process. It goes for about 25 minutes. If you want to check that out, um, I give some other examples. That's really valuable as well. Guys, thank you for listening. Oh, that's the final slide. I thought there was something else. That's all I have to say. Thanks so much.